Good evening, everyone. I am Ariana Cohen-Halberstam. I am the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival. Before we get into what I know is gonna be an incredible conversation with Emma Seligman and Anna Fetter, I wanna take our moment to thank our partners on tonight's program. Some of the most amazing Boston Film Festivals have partnered on this film. So thank you to the Boston Women's Film Festival, Wicked Queer, IFF Boston, and Bright Lights Film Series, and thank you to Keshet. I recommend checking out all of these programs and organizations. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator tonight, the brilliant director of programming in the Visual Media Arts Department at Emerson College, who curates the Bright Lights Film Series, Anna Fetter, and the director of Shiva Baby, her first feature film, Emma Seligman. Thank you both for being a part of Boston Jewish Film and for joining us tonight. Thank you thank for you. having us. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start, first of all, by congratulating you on a very impressive first feature film. I know that you've been receiving lots of attention, lots of accolades, lots of critical acclaim, um, but I just wanted to start by adding to that. Um, Thank I also you. Want to say, <laughs> I also want to say, um, uh, and I know we were talking about this before we went live, that I actually couldn't think of a better time to be discussing the film. Um, <laughs> It might be one of the most anxiety pro provoking films that I have ever seen. And I know we were talking about, you know, folks responding differently in different age groups. I'm kind of right in the <laughs> middle, I'm, I'm middle age. Um, but I think also more as a queer Jewish woman, it, it, like that there's something that really resonates strongly. Um, and then I also feel like we're sort of just on the other side um, of a few very anxiety provoking days in the country. Um, yeah, yes. yeah, it's like a, like a, like a chuckle of relief, right? Um, yes. so, uh, there, there are quite a few decisions that you and all your collaborators made to really ratchet up and sustain that anxiety from like the cinematography to the music. So I was just hoping you could speak a little bit about some of the ways that you use the language of film to keep us really like on the edge of our seat through the whole film. Definitely. Um, well, I'm so glad that you pointed out that, yeah, we, it was a number of different decisions in order to ratchet up that anxiety. And knowing now that you're a film professor, I, I can understand that you'd have an appreciation for that. Um, yeah, I think that first it came in the script and watching other um, anxiety inducing films, whether they be thrillers or just really tense and awkward family dramas like um, Cretia was a movie I rewatched and and Black Swan but then also like Rachel Getting Married um, and uh, some other films and so it started off there and just trying to make it as tight uh, and physically anxiety inducing as possible because I knew we would be in one space and there wasn't a lot we could get away with so something as small as like you know ripped tights or whatever like I tried to figure out ways in which to uh, amp up the tension and then definitely in cinematography and trying to find different ways to uh, create claustrophobia that wasn't just the same sort of like close-ups all in all, but like using Zoom and um, just using camera movement in different kinds of ways. Um, and so we watched a lot of like uh, Cassavetti's movies, uh, specifically Opening Night, because there's a lot of like claustrophobic scenes in the lobby in that film where there's just a lot of people over, over top each other. Um, and then I would say that tension continued um, in the way we directed the performances, but then most importantly in the edit. And just, you know, originally it was gonna be like an hour and a half and that was our first cut. And then it went down to only 77 minutes. So it really just became about overlapping the dialogue as much as possible, just making it super tight. Um, and then most importantly, I think with the music, with um, uh, our wonderful composer, Ariel Marx's score, I think that probably had the biggest effect in, in ramping up the anxiety um, and the tension. So it did, it was a really multi-step process um, in creating the anxiety. And there were, there were little devices or little, um, you know, uh, for an audience member, like the phone, you know, you knew that was left in a bad place and you're sort of waiting, you're waiting for when that comes back to bite her. And so I feel like there's, you know, an audience is paying attention is sort of catching all of the things along the way that you know you sort of know are gonna come to a head or are gonna cause problems for this character. And so it's, you know, it's uh, it, it works incredibly well. Um, Thank so, you. <laughs> so when you were writing uh, the short and then the feature, um, 
I mean, I know you get sort of asked this, um, what ways did you draw on your own personal experiences and the experiences of those around you? Sure. Um, well, I felt like I chose to do this story because it resonated so much with me and my personal experiences. Um, I think, you know, I've been to a lot of shivas in my time um, and it was not hard for me to have the dialogue sort of roll off my tongue and roll off my fingers in terms of creating the world and having authentic characters. So I tried to draw from my family and my family events as much as possible. Um, and then I think for Danielle, um, I really channeled a lot of my um, frustrations about um, my source of power within my sexuality and, and power dynamics and um, feeling a sense of loss when it came to my self-worth and sexual validation um, when I was graduating and leaving this sort of world of, of hookup culture in college and all of these things. Um, and then I definitely drew on my friends' experiences being sugar babies. Um, sugaring is like a huge part of um, the world uh, that I, in which I went to school, like at NYU, it was a huge subculture. Um, and a lot of my friends did it and a lot of my friends tried it. And I was super familiar with seeking arrangement and all of that. Um, but, you know, my experiences in that world were so not nearly enough to make a whole, you know, authentic movie about it. So I definitely drew on their experiences and their feelings, um, you know, regarding their sugar daddies. Um, so, you know, um, a lot was drawn from personal stuff, but I've never run into my sugar daddy at a shiva. So I also had to take from other places too. And I, I was watching a, an interview, I think it was TIFF, um, that Rachel was a part of, and she was talking about these, these power dynamics and the conversations that happen between the two of you about who has power and what's seen and who doesn't. Have. So it's so much about, you know, when you say that it's, you know, you're sort of struggling with your own um, sort of feeling powerless in some situations or, you know, or, or certainly, you know, around graduating, um, that that, you know, it seems like it, it really comes through in the film that, you know, one minute she's in a position of power and the ne next minute she's she's sort of fallen from that. And she's in a position where she's definitely not the one you know, <laughs> and it has power in the situation. Definitely, yeah. And I'm very grateful that I had Rachel to build that with. Um, I think every scene was sort of about like who has the power, like you said. And then once she gains the power, what does she do with it? And often the, the case is that she acts on it and then immediately loses it um, because she thinks she's empowered by uh, her sexuality and then it sort of drops off. Um, but uh, yeah, Rachel is uh, very pivotal in terms of that, um, in, in that build throughout the film. And so Rachel, I mean, she really carries the film as the titular role of the Shiva baby. I know that she also shares that with an actual baby. Um, <laughs> can you talk about the collaboration between the both of you? I mean, you, I know that you've said that you, you'd always thought that she would be in the feature um, after the short. Yeah, um, well, I just felt like she put such a stamp on the short film. It was originally supposed to be more of a dramedy and I felt like she just made it so much um, her own. Um, she's a fantastic comedian and uh, does stand up and is just so good at improvisation um, that I became really close with her after the short. And then I attested a lot of the success of the short film to her performance. Um, and as we got closer, she also became incredibly invested um, as a friend and as a as an actor and a producer in seeing the short film become a feature, which she knew that I wanted to do so much. So, you know, if she had been sort of, um, you know, mediocre, I would have been like, eh, let's open this role up for someone that is a name or, you know, a star or whatever. And so I will say that it actually was difficult in keeping her on because we, um, you know, had difficulty getting the financing because they just sort of wanted to open it up to a bigger person. Um, but she was so incredible and she's the only actor because she was my good friend that would read multiple drafts of the scripts and give me notes and her thoughts and dialogue suggestions. Um, and she's the only person um, who would sit down with me who would um, go through each scene like we were talking about before and be like, who has the power? Or like, how are you feeling? Or how are you trying to navigate this situation? Because the whole movie really does fall on her shoulders. Um, so it was a wonderful collaboration. I think, you know, only until the end when we had wrapped, did I truly realize how much pressure she felt to be leading a film that had wonderful, incredible, you know, um, uh, 
performing actors, um, uh, performing actors, so great supporting roles uh, fulfilled by actors that we know, like Fred Malamud and Diana Agron and things like that. So only at the end was like, oh, not only were you a fantastic actor, but you felt this pressure this whole time <laughs> um, that you were leading this movie. So um, I'm very grateful that I had her and um, she was, uh, I think she was incredible. And you sort of reference it, but I don't know if everyone understands that when you go to finance a film, there's so much pressure to have sort of known quantities, known actors in, in the roles. Um, and so how did you, how did you address that with, with folks interested in financing the film? How did you, how were you able to, to keep Rachel in that role? So, you know, ultimately we were able to do that because we raised the money independently. Um, we initially were going to production companies and everybody that we knew who were either professors or mentors, you know, my producers who were my age, you know, uh, and from school, we'd all interned and worked at a bunch of companies. So we went that route. And in that, we sort of got some, some pushback a little bit. We also got a ton of advice and, and really wonderful um, even though we didn't end up getting money from any of those places, we did, they were uh, formative conversations, um, informative conversations. Um, so, you know, because we ultimately financed the film from really just a collection of cobbled together small investments from either my family friends or Rachel's or um, our producers or like so many different people. There were two uh, people who were investors who had had experience before and were, were formal sort of financiers, but the rest of them were completely new. And um, I think that they ultimately just believed in the project. And I think the short film and Rachel being so amazing in it definitely helped sort of sell her on the, um, uh, you know, being the lead in the feature. Uh, but I think we had control. I think if we made this with a production company, if any one of those places had said yes to us, then it might have been a lot more difficult, but it was only something that um, we sort of came up against a couple times. And each time I was so surprised and then my producers were like, I actually thought we'd be getting way more of this. Um, so it was sort of a balancing act, but our goal was to try to stack up the rest of the cast with people who you might recognize because, um, because Rachel is less recognizable. Yeah, and it's also a, a, a typical um, experience, I think, for young directors and for female directors. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it's not an anomaly for you to sort of be in that situation. But now you have, you know, this feature and now that you have this, you know, and the, and the, the acclaim, then ho one hopes that fundraising will be sort of be easier <laughs> in the future. Well, I shouldn't say that because I know that it's not necessarily the case. Even David Lynch has to, you know, go hat in hand to get money to make his, his film, so. Yeah, one can only hope, but I have heard it's like the more money you're getting from people, the more, you know, uh, you know, the less control that you have. Like I had final cut, all the things, whatever. Now that I'm sort of entertaining the idea of not having final cut on the next movie, I'm like, wait, what? Like, how, how do I not have full control as a filmmaker? Um, so it's interesting, but I do hope and think that it will be easier to fundraise going forward. Yeah. So I want to ask you about the other collaborations on the film, um, you know, particularly for a first film, like the, the people that you surround yourself with at all the different stages of production are really crucial for you being able to achieve your vision and for getting your film made and out there. So um, are there other sort of collaborations that you really want to highlight? Yeah, I, I mean, I relied so heavily on my producers for a year or so leading up to the movie. Um, they were my friends from school. The three of us had never made a feature, but they were the best producers I knew in school in terms of shorts and music videos and commercials and all that stuff. So I rely on them so much for gave, giving me such great notes on so many drafts of the script and for putting their heads together with me for so long to be like, how can we raise the money? Um, we brought on our third producer. Um, her name is Lizzie. Uh, she had just produced her first feature. And even though she was still only a couple years ahead of us and within our community, she had just had that really um, informative, important experience. So um, she she was able to help cross us over the finish line with financing and with casting. I think that our casting director was really crucial. Um, she really um, just really went to bat for us and really advocated for us in terms of going to all the agents and managers of, of all these wonderful actors. Um, and she was very strategic about going to New York 
actors because we couldn't afford to really put many people up. Um, she turned to like the theater community and the Jewish community. Um, so Kate Geller was incredible. Um, I'll also say because I've already talked about how important working with um, our cinematographer Maria was and our editor Hannah Park and our composer um, Ariel Marks. Um, our AD, our assistant director Gerardo was so pivotal because this movie is all about continuity and we didn't have a script supervisor because we couldn't afford one. So working with him and our uh, cinematographer Maria was so crucial for the week or two weeks leading up to the shoot because it was all about, we had a Lego board, but we also were lucky enough to be in the house. So we were like, if we just, if he understood every single shot and why it was important. And he would be like, if you just switch the angle, then we don't see that character in that room. And then we don't have to schedule them for that day. And it was just so, it was so Tetrisy, and I really, value him and made me value assistant directors a whole lot more than I already had um, uh, in terms of the scheduling process when you're working on an indie and you know every set every actor especially if they're bigger only has like three days to give you or five days it's really tough to figure out how everything slots together so I feel like a lot of people who watch films don't often think about like assistant directors but they're so so pivotal when you're making stuff for a small budget um, especially so yeah, that, that was very important. So um, I know that there's been some conversation around authenticity with you identifying as queer and Jewish and then around the actors in the film, some of whom are not Jewish playing Jewish roles and vice versa. Um, and I, I know you said it didn't matter there were Jewish people in the, uh, the it did matter there were Jewish people in the film, sorry, but it didn't feel necessary that everyone was Jewish or that a Jewish person was necessarily playing a Jewish role. I just want to ask what you think about the conversation itself. I mean, is it an important one to have? Because it's happening in all different areas of the industry. Definitely. I do think it's a really important one to have. And I'm super um, curious and um, open-minded and trying to constantly keep up to date and hear different opinions on it. I think that there is a difference when you're working on a film for a very small budget um, and you're trying to sort of strike different um, strike a balance between someone being good for the part, ideally well-known and um, ideally either Jewish or queer or whatever the identity is um, within the movie. Um, and it was something that I definitely set out to do. I wanted to have as many Jewish people as possible, but at the same time, I knew that I would have to, um, I would have to, I, I wouldn't be able to get all of it. And I think what's important, you know, Rachel, I think it felt even more important to me because Rachel is not Jewish and she's not queer. I will say, you know, for someone leading the movie, it was more important for me that she understood the character and what it was like to go home to a huge family and have to feel insecure about your job and not having a partner and, um, you know, all of the things that I, I felt were more crucial to the role. And she is Italian, which I feels like a cop out to say, but she does come from a really big family and, and knows what that feels like. Um, so because she's not Jewish and because she's not queer, it felt more important to me that I stack up the rest of the cast um, with, with Jewish people, you know, like you mentioned, yeah, not Diana Agron is a good example of she is Jewish, but she's playing a not Jewish character. Polly Draper is not Jewish, but she's married to a Jewish person. It, it felt important to me that, um, there were elements of, of truth and authenticity even when it couldn't get fully right. Um, but I will say going forward, you know, ideally when you have more money, when you have more control, when you can attract bigger actors, I would love to be able to have full authenticity as much as I can. I don't regret any of the choices we made with Shiva Baby. I think Molly Gordon is a really good example. She's Jewish, but she's not queer, which meant that both actresses were queer playing those roles. Um, which was tough, but at the same time, she's, I, I so loved working with her and she was so fantastic and she's, and she does come from a very Jewish world. Um, you know, uh, her, her parents have been directors forever and her dad, you know, has directed tons of episodes of Curb and Seinfeld. So like she comes so much from that world. Um, and that felt really important to me. Um, so it's tough when you're making something on an indie level. I think what's important when it comes to this conversation is the thought. I think, I don't know about some of the more bigger budget stuff that doesn't have a ton of Jewish actors within it, but I would only hope that the casting directors and the directors and the showrunners or whoever's putting it together has the, the impulse to try to have an authentic cast, whether or not it ends up being fully Jewish or half Jewish or whatever it is. 
I would only hope that there is um, some integrity in, try, in trying to make it authentic as possible, knowing that you're not going to end up striking out with every single actor. And it's a, it's a, it's a very different conversation than when you're talking about, you know, perhaps, you know, non-trans actors playing trans parts because there's, you know, we, there is Jewish representation in, 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 in film and in television. And so it's, it doesn't have the same kind of weight. Like it's an important discussion, but I think it's also important to, to say that, you know, that it's, it, that it's, you know, that, that we, that we have a certain amount of representation already. So it's not, it's not as if the limited representation ha has to carry more weight or more importance or more significance. And so, you know, it's a good totally. conversation to have, but I think that, you know, that, uh, you know, there are all these other sort of components to the conversation. And so I think that the fact of having this conversation around the film is really brilliant and that you're engaging with it and that, you know, that it's important to you and that you recognize the ways in which, you know, things like budget affect, you know, what you can do. But, um, but it's also, of course, really interesting that the sort of, you know, main Shiksa character is actually played by someone who's <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> totally. Well, thank you. I mean, I do feel like it almost goes against sort of the like what a Jew looks like or feels like or whatever, just yeah. sort of idea. Because I do think there is importance for an actor like knowing that world when they step into a role. But when people are like, well, they don't look Jewish. It's like, well, what does that mean? Um, I know Diana grew up because her mom converted um, with people being like, well, you're not really Jewish and you don't look Jewish. And you don't have Jewish features. So you don't really get what that part of being Jewish is. And I find that so frustrating to hear. And I'm sure it's very frustrating to experience. Um, so I think playing with those things are, are sort of funny when it comes to stereotypes and the waspy or chicks of stereotype or whatever um, in this movie in particular. And that's a good sort of segue into um, a question that I'm gonna sort of rephrase a little bit Someone was asking, um, did you worry about creating stereotypes? You know, you sort of have the, the mother character is, a little, you know, is different than the stereotype, but there's definitely some notes there and some notes with the father. And um, so were the characters based on people you knew? How did you, how did you sort of keep them familiar without going into the, the stereotype end? It's so um, tricky to walk that line. I do, I based, the, I base the parents off of my parents. Um, I, they're not total direct, um, uh, you know, uh, crossovers, I would say. Um, and I, every single experience that Danielle has in the film is written word for word off of something that I experienced within my family. And I think that often, no matter what culture you're drawing from um, or whatever your background is, I think the most important thing is that the writer and the director come from that world. Um, but I will say, I think within at least my perform Ashkenazi Jewish community, sometimes it's like, you cannot make this stuff up. Like I'm living with my parents in quarantine and sometimes they say the most ridiculous things that I'm like, if I wrote this into a film, I would be accused of anti-Semitic anti stereotyping. Um, uh, and I think it's tough. I mean, I totally get when people are like this sort of fulfill stereotypes, even if it is truthful, um, but I really just wrote what I knew and I did try to be mindful of stereotyping as much as I could, but I think it's a really hard line to walk when that's just your experience and, and that's what it's like to be in a big Jewish family sometimes. So, um, try to be mindful, but I, at the end of the day, it, it's pretty difficult, I think, to not fall into those, um, into those tropes, um, because unfortunately there is truth to them. Yeah, there's always a, you know, it comes from somewhere. It doesn't, you know, um, these characters do exist. The, you know, kibitzing yentas, they do, they do exist. We, we've all encountered them. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I'm trying to look at the, the comments. Um, oh, there's a comment from uh, Francis saying that maybe queer parts should be played by queer actors since queer actors have a hard time being believed as straight characters. Um, oh, so the question out of this is, do some groups need to be represented by actors from their own communities more than others? And I think we were starting to sort of talk about that. Yeah, um, I do, I, I, I do think that. I think, um, like I said earlier, sometimes you have to, to, to pick. I do think that's a good point that there's definitely more Jewish actors <laughs> working in Hollywood um, playing themselves or not playing Jews. Um, 
than queer actors. Um, but it was hard. I mean, I always said to our casting director and to my producers that Maya, who's played by Molly Gordon, has to be either Jewish or queer or ideally both. Um, and casting this movie was so difficult. We were casting up until the day we shot, you know, Diana Agron and Molly's deals didn't go through in terms of, you know, locking everything down with their agents and all of the terms like days before we shot. Um, and I do think it's it's tough to strike a balance. I do think going forward though, with fun, with having more control, with having fundraising, with everything, um, I'm much more excited about actually working with authentic queer actors and Jewish actors um, in their roles um, and trying to create more space for them to either portray themselves or to portray straight people or um, cis people, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's something that I look forward to, but I, and it was just difficult on this film. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I don't know if everyone understands the difficulties in making a first film that there are all these things that you ideally want to do, you know, and, and it just, you know, it's, it's one of those, you know, it becomes a goal, you know, when you're in a position where you have the ideal, if you ever have the, you know, sort of ideal scenario where, you know, you have the money you want and the time you want and the people you want, but that's, you know, that everybody's sort of striving to do these things in, in a better, in a better way. Definitely. Yeah. So there's another, okay. So let's see, um, from, some anonymous uh, attendee, can you speak to the decisions behind the pacing of the film? And they said, as a young Jewish person, I got a ton of second hang and anxiety while, while watching. <laughs> um, can I speak to the pacing of the film? Yes, um, I think the pacing came through, like I said earlier, kind of with that anxiety, like um, it really came in the edit. Um, I think that it just became, when you're when you're, I mean, yes, it's attributed to, to being a Jewish film and, and being a young anxious film, of, you know, where this young character has all these anxieties going on. So those elements already exist. Um, but I think within, within a, a film that takes place in one day and one location, the, for me at least, the most important thing is ramping up anxiety because otherwise you, you run the risk of people being like, why are we stuck in this house for this entire movie on board? Um, so I think that the most important thing you can do is amp up that anxiety and that intense pacing so that no one ever feels like it drags. And then, you know, maybe people did feel like that. Um, and I won't put it past them because we were stuck in one, one house this, for this whole time. Um, but uh, I think the pace, that's why I chose to have the pacing that I did. And I think that came mostly in the edit, um, working with our incredible editor, um, Hannah Park. Like I said earlier, the original cut was an hour and a half and then it went down to 77, 70, 71, honestly, minutes plus credits. Um, uh, so that was just sort of the mentality of trying to keep it as anxious as possible. Um, uh, while not, you know, I think this, this movie could have been totally different. It could have been very slapstick and outrageous, sort of like death at the funeral vibes where like crazy things are happening and people are on drugs or running around or whatever. Um, and that would have been a lot of fun. And then I don't think I would have had to rely so much on pacing and anxiety, but because I wanted to keep it in a sort of naturalistic grounded world, um, I think that was um, the only thing I could rely on to, um, to have people stay in their seats, I guess, so to speak even though it wasn't in theaters. I just, for some reason, when you're talking, I flashed to a version where she accidentally takes LSD or she, <laughs> she's taken LSD and, oh, but wait, the shivers today and I have to show up. <laughs> I just, I guess that would have just ramped up the anxiety, but it would have been very different. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people are like, is she drunk? Like she seems to be drinking a lot, but she's not like slurring her words and I was like, yeah, I can't have her slip into that territory where she's like all of a sudden like the drunk girl with the shiva. Like, I mean, she already sort of does some crazy stuff in it, but um, yeah, could would have been a very different movie if she was uh, either you know on drugs or intoxicated. So this is actually a good follow up question from someone um, asking again about the anxiety and the tension, but that the movie was described as a comedy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was counter to what they were anticipating. And so do you consider this a comedy and how does it, how does it work <laughs> as a comedy? Um, I think comedy is just as tense as horror films. I think that, uh, I think that horror films, when you're, when you're scared, you laugh really hard. And I think when you're um, laughing, you're cringing often uh, a lot of the time. Um, 
I set out to like make just a good movie. I not to be like I don't consider it any genre. I I do consider it a dark comedy. I think my favorite um, comedies are sort of of the Jewish morbid world. I consider A Serious Man a comedy, even though it's really dark. Um, I consider Fargo and so many of the Coen Brothers films comedies, um, even though there's murder and tension and anxiety. Um, uh, so I set out to make a comedy and I just wanted I think especially in the cinematography to set it apart from every other comedy uh when it comes to like a lot of my writing references were like kissing Jessica Stein or keeping the faith or crossing Delancey um or even obvious child which are all incredible films and I was like how do we stand out and I think in that in those sort of um techniques that you were mentioning earlier it ended up becoming something else so when people are like it's kind of like a horror film I'm like well yes sometimes it's like a horror movie being inside the, the mind of a young woman um and when people are like it's a psychological thriller or it's this or it's that I'm so happy and excited to hear how people label it I think at the end of the day I still consider it to be a dark comedy that's my long-winded answer to the genre question but yeah yeah I mean it's you know it it I, I mean, I personally, dark comedies are my favorite. That's, you know, that's that kind of, of, of laughing at sometimes things that aren't supposed to be funny is definitely very rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from Mary. Um, you mentioned that the, the film was somewhat autobiographical. How did your family respond to the film? Excellent question. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> they loved it. A few people have asked me that and, um, I would say, you know, especially in COVID, I, my immediate family loved it, I think, because they're extremely biased. They're very supportive of me. Um, and they love movies and they love these kinds of films that we were talking about, really dark comedies. Um, I will say, I don't really know too much about how my extended family <laughs> felt about it. Um, I, a lot of them messaged me because they watched it either through the Toronto Film Festival or Toronto Jewish Film Festival or um, there was a, a Inside Out Queer Film Festival in Toronto. So a lot of them did have the chance to watch it. And a few of them sent me really nice messages, but I haven't seen them in person. And also they're very, I'm Canadian, they're very polite. And I don't think would ever share with me if they didn't enjoy it or if there were parts of it that they um, didn't like. So overall, everyone seems positive, but I'm not sure if there were other reactions um, that I'm not aware of um, that were maybe more negative. <laughs> Well, my a good follow-up question to that is, you know, it, it sounds like you had friends that were doing sex work and, um, and I'm kind of curious and, and you were drawing from, from some of their experiences and some of your experiences. What, what have they thought about the film? Um, they've loved it and just been incredibly supportive of me. Um, uh, I think that, I think that they're, they, you know, no one, I have had someone reach out to me that was a Jewish sex worker, sex worker that said, you know, I felt so seen in this and it's such a specific world, et cetera. Um, uh, but, you know, my friends that, uh, that are, are sex workers that have watched it, I think more than any, anything, they've just been incredibly proud and excited for me, like how most of my friends are and really enjoyed it. But, um, you know, I, I haven't heard specific, I, I ended up just asking them so much about their experiences in writing the film so, you know, none of them have been like, wow, you included this part because they've all been so aware of how the movie was going to turn out and, and what was going to be in the plot, et cetera. Um, so, so that's sort of been the reaction from them. And it's, I mean, we're in a place now where the depiction of sex work on screen has evolved so much, you know, that, that you can just have this, this character who's a main character and this is just part of her identity. This is just part of, you know, mm -hmm. how, she, how she finds power, that it's not, you know, it's not a crisis. It's not, do you know what I mean? That it's, you know, it's just sort of how, how, she, how she goes about her, her business, how she lives her life. Totally, yeah. So um, I wanted to, I mentioned this before, but congratulations on all the critical acclaim for the film. I'm just sort of wondering where is the film screen so far and what's been the response from audiences and is there a difference between big market festivals like TIFF and then queer festivals like Outfest and then Jewish film festivals like this one? Because lots of different audiences that this is speaking to. 
You know, I think that because it's all virtual this year, or maybe it would have been this way regardless, the most love that I've gotten for the film has from every single festival. Um, but I would say especially TIFF when there was, you know, a lot of people were able to watch it um, and it had a bigger stage. Um, uh, was from young women, which was always my goal to, to, to reach that audience more than anybody else. Um, the, no one has like told me they, no one's reached out and been like, I hated this movie. Um, so I'm waiting for that day. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been incredibly positive. Um, I'll say the people that I think have loved it the most have been, you know, young women, um, often young queer women, especially, um, uh, I think the few people that I've heard have, haven't liked it have generally been in, in not to like pigeonhole them because every opinion is is important but but uh older uh men um who maybe didn't understand what the character is going through even when we did test screenings we screened for some professors and one guy was like I just don't get what she's doing but everyone else was like I get it and I was like okay I'm okay with this this is sort of being the result of of the reactions um so uh, I, I've been very happy that it played so well at TIFF um, and Outfest um, and um, all of the things, but the audience really hasn't changed. Like, I think that I, I, I feel very lucky that I've had mostly young women reaching out from all of them, but um, also Jewish, just Jewish people across the board, whether young or old or queer or straight. Um, uh, so I feel very lucky um, in that regard. I don't know if you can hear, I have very loud kitty in the background. I just realized I forgot to put her. I can't hear her, but, or hear them, but. She, she likes That's attention. Cute. This is an older kitty and she's, <laughs> she's just meowing there in the background. I was like, uh oh, I don't know if anybody can hear that. So, um, so what's the, what's the future for the film? Where is it going next? How can people support the film? How can they encourage other people to see it? Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, we are very lucky to have a distributor now. So, excuse me, we will be out sometime next year, whether that's VOD or, you know, a little bit in theaters or if it's a hybrid release, we're not sure yet. It will be sometime in 2021. Um, I think, I think I can say safely in the first part of the year um, or the first half of the year. Um, but we're continuing to play at lots of festivals, especially local Jewish film festivals and queer film festivals um, across the US and um, uh, luckily around the world. Um, uh, if you're in the UK or Germany or uh, Latin America, we're gonna be uh, distributed via MUBI or MUBI, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, but, but they're great. Um, so that's where you can check it out. Um, but for any other festival updates, you can um, follow the Shiva Baby movie Instagram um, and everything is posted there in terms of where we'll be playing. And the festival reminded me that uh, you can still access it through the festival through uh, the 15th of November. So you have like a whole week to tell people, hey, you need to see this film and, and folks can watch yes. it. I believe the next Jewish film festival we're playing is in Philadelphia. So they will also play there um, soon. Uh, within I think the next month or so so yes so that's the next one <laughs> and um and uh we have a, another question what's next what 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 are your plans and someone is rec they're also recommending uh you make a horror film <laughs> <laughs> I do want to make a horror film I would love to be able to make a sort of horror version of this but in a different sort of world so it's not too similar but uh, I think I would love to do a mommy dearest sort of suffocation vibes of this movie, but taken to an extreme uh, horror level. So thank you for the recommendation. Um, the main thing that's next is um, Rachel Sennett, uh, who plays Danielle. She's also, you know, um, if people don't know, a wonderful comedian and a writer. So her and I have been working on a script for a long time. Um, that's a very campy, queer high school comedy, sort of in the vein of like, what hot American summer, but more for, you know, a Gen Z queer audience. Um, and we'll be making that um, sometime next year. So we're really excited um, to do that. Um, and that's the main thing up next, but um, quarantine has also allowed me to be able to kind of sit back and develop other ideas, whether or not I'll go forward with them or not. Yeah, I feel like there's this pressure after your first film is like, what are we doing next? And, you know, and, and, and now you've got, you know, the space at least, you know, 
silver linings and all to, you know, yeah. take your time and, and get definitely. That's a good, that's a good point. I feel like I watched my friend who made her first feature a year before me just do the festival circuit by flying everywhere and, and yeah, as a fun as, as, as much fun as she had, she also was extremely exhausted. So I didn't want this to happen, but the silver lining is that I've gotten to sleep a lot more. <laughs> so we'll see. So it is a pro to have the ability and the space to think about this stuff. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for answering all the questions and the brilliant conversation. And thanks for your fantastic film. Thank you so much for having me and, and for this conversation. This was so lovely. Thank you both so much. And as Anna said, the film is playing with us until November 15th. And actually Rachel said it is in another film screening at our festival, Tahara. So if you yes. want more of her, check that <laughs> one out as well. And I'm so glad you both were able to join us tonight um, and to be a part of the Boston Jewish Film Festival. Thank you. I just also want to say, see Tahara, but it is also an anxiety provoking <laughs> film. And you should be ready for that. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night. And everyone, uh, we look forward to seeing you at more conversations throughout the next week and a half. Okay. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.